Hello and welcome to Legendary Africa, the podcast where a disembodied voice speaks about African myths, legends, and folklore straight into your ear canal. Good news, people. I have officially made it out of your sinuses and am now approximately in the middle of who even knows. My knowledge of anatomy is limited and I may or may not be somewhere near your left or right eyeball. It is unclear. It was a close call a few hours ago, I can tell you. I nearly fell down your throat and we all know where I would have eventually ended up. So... All I can tell you is that I am currently surrounded by really soft, jelly-like organisms which kind of just float around, and there's mist everywhere, and something keeps brushing is my leg. So if you develop a sudden twitch in one of your eyes, that's just me jumping around and away from eye jellyfish. Basically, sea walled in here. get into it, I have a couple of interesting news headlines for you. Egypt hits back after Elon Musk claims that aliens built the pyramids. Musk tweeted that aliens built the Egyptian pyramids and this didn't sit so well with the Egyptian Minister of International Cooperation, who invited Musk to visit Egypt to see the pyramids and evidence of human labor for himself. Not to mention, Egyptian archaeologist Zahi Hawass basically told Musk to hold up a minute and then educated him on what evidence we have regarding the man-made pyramids. In the end, Musk retweeted her history article on the building of the pyramids and said that it made a fair amount of sense. So, I'm not sure he's convinced that aliens were not involved, but at least he seems a little more accepting of the archaeological evidence. The next headline is a headline I recently discovered. It's quite old, but it boggled my mind. So, In a cafe in Akashi, Japan, you can watch a variety of fish and other sea creatures while you pee. And they can watch you. So the toilet is surrounded on three sides by a giant aquarium folded hundreds of exotic fish and a single male turtle, and it is only found in the ladies' bathroom. It reportedly cost $270,000 to build and has attracted customers for over 12 years. It both distresses and relaxes customers in equal measure, and some people even spend more time than they need on the loo just so they can see all the fish. The world is truly a fascinating place. Today we're back with some more amazing animal folk tales from Africa. In this episode, we're all about elephants. Elephants are amazing creatures, and I have two wonderful stories for you. The first tale originates with the Ibibio people of Nigeria. The Ibibio people are reportedly the earliest inhabitants of southern Nigeria, settling there approximately around 7000 BC. Now, before Nigeria was colonized, the main religion of the Ibibio people was called Inam and involved the worshipping of Abasi Enyong, the god of heaven, Abasi Isong, the god of the earth, and Abasi Ibom, the supreme being. The Ibibio people also had areas in each village, which they refer to as Akai, which means forest. And these areas were considered sacred. No one was allowed to clear the trees or hunt or gather in the forest, aside from groups which belonged to certain Ibibio secret societies. They also had specific ideas regarding the human soul and the afterlife. For example, Okpong, which means soul, had four different specific meanings. Ethereal body, soul, spirit, and oversoul, which resided in the house of Abasi Ibom, the supreme being. Now after you die... The Ibibio believe that you continue in the same existence as you were in before death, as if nothing had happened. So like, you exist in a separate realm, but have the same life and enjoyments you had when you were alive. After missionaries arrived in the early 19th century, Christianity took over as the main religion, and on the 27th of August 2020, only last month, the first ever Ibibio Bible translation was published, making history. The Ibibio Bible was created by eight Ibibio professors. And now, our story. A terrible famine swept across the great land, slowly at first, and then quickly, and soon all the animals were starving as all the plants had died. Only Leopard, who ate meat, was unconcerned. However, he realized that an opportunity had presented itself to him. 
He gathered all the other animals and announced that he, Leopard, was the strongest of all of them, and because of this needed the most food. I need to eat, unlike you pathetic creatures, Leopard growled. Sacrifice your grandmothers to me, or else I will devour all of you. All the other animals were terrified, and while they were fond of their grandmothers, decided to save their own hides, coats, and other skins. Leopard promised that he would not eat all their grandmothers at once, but go through them one by one, so that he would most likely not get to their mothers, as the famine would be over by then. So first Squirrel presented his scrawny grandmother to Leopard. In one gulp he ate her up and was highly dissatisfied. Well, that hardly counted, Leopard grumbled. She was just an appetizer. I need something more substantial. So Wildcat shoved his grandmother to the front to watch her displeasure. But Leopard took one look at the old mangy thing and wrinkled his nose in disgust. Stop feeding me these diseased things. I need proper food, he roared, making the earth tremble. <laughs> so Bushbuck pushed and pulled his grandmother until she tottered in front of the leopard. And though she was then, Leopard's hunger was finally sated for the day. And so this went on day by day. Soon it was Elephant's turn. But Elephant did not have a grandmother and explained to Leopard that she had died some time ago. A few other creatures came forward to vouch for Elephant, and Leopard pardoned him. A few days passed, and Leopard had eventually eaten his way through all the grandmothers, but the famine was still not over. Bring your mothers, or else you will be next, Leopard snarled. <laughs> Now, although the animals were sad to lose their grandmothers, they were much closer to their mothers, and there was much wailing and crying and protesting. In the end, however, they were forced to sacrifice their mothers to Leopard's never-ending appetite. First Bushbuck, then Hyena, then Squirrel, who was very close to his mother and mourned greatly. Then Elephant. But once again, Elephant came to Leopard empty-handed. Or was it empty-trunked? I'm afraid I do not know where my mother is. She has simply vanished, Elephant claimed. So Leopard once again pardoned Elephant, although he was a little annoyed as he had been looking forward to dining on rich elephant flesh. Unknown to Elephant, however, Squirrel had watched the entire thing and grew suspicious. The next day, Squirrel was gathering nuts and spotted Elephant making his way through the bush. Taking to the trees, Squirrel followed him easily until they came to a mountain. To his surprise, he spotted a long rope descending from the mountain. He was even more surprised when Elephant produced a large basket, half full with food. Elephant then climbed into the basket and tugged the rope. Squirrel almost fell out of his tree when he saw what happened next. Elephant began ascending up the mountain. After some time, the basket came down, not only with Elephant in it, and Squirrel knew instantly what had happened. Elephant was hiding his mother on the mountain. Leaping and bounding, Squirrel hurried to where Leopard slept, and very, very carefully woke him up. Ooh, breakfast, Leopard growled, and licked his lips as he stared at Squirrel. No, wait! I have come here to tell you of Elephant's deceitful behavior. He has been cheating you off your food, Squirrel squealed frantically. Leopard paused mid pounced and frowned. What? Elephant? Lying to me? Tell me everything, he demanded. So Squirrel did, and Leopard soon decided to go to the mountain early the next morning. When he arrived at the base of the mountain, he saw the empty basket, and climbing in, gave it a tug. To his surprise, he soon was lifted up, up, up to the top of the mountain, where he found a very shocked mother elephant. He attacked her instantly, but could not bite through her hide. Instead, Leopard threw her off the mountain, deciding to eat her when he got down. Soon elephant arrived and tugged at the rope. Nothing happened. He tugged again, but again, there was no response. His mighty heart fell, and he slowly walked around the mountain. Not too long afterwards, he found the broken body of his mother, partly eaten by leopard. Throwing his head back, he let out a loud wail which resounded throughout the land for all to hear. Since that day, leopard has been the enemy of elephant. An elephant does not hesitate to stamp on Squirrel if he comes too close to his mighty feet. Oh, poor elephant. It wasn't his fault that Squirrel was too dumb to figure out how to hide his mother in a tree. Now before we start the next tale, I wanted to tell you some interesting facts about elephants. The African elephant is the largest creature on land, measuring up to 3 meters high. They also live to about 70 years old. 2. An elephant's trunk has a life of its own. I am serious here. There are over 150,000 muscles in an elephant's trunk. 
They can pick up a peanut, shell it, chuck the shell, and then eat the peanut, all with their trunks. Also, the trunk can contain 8 litres of water and can even be used as a snorkel when they swim. Elephants need to eat almost constantly. They eat the equivalent of about 375 tons of baked beans. And I love baked beans, but that's a little crazy. This is a sad but important fact. Almost 90% of African elephants have died out in the past century due to the ivory trade and human encroachment into their environment. There are only 45,000 elephants left in the wild. This is a very small number of people. We need to do better. Our next tale is from the Bakongo people of Central Africa. The Kingdom of Congo was founded in the 14th century, and kingship was based on an election by the court nobles from the Congo people. Now, the Portuguese arrived around the 1470s, but only came across the kingdom in 1483. The Bakongo had already established markets, a currency, and had a developed infrastructure to transport goods for trade. And they were willing to trade with the Portuguese. The Congo king at that time, named Nzinga and Nkuu, allegedly willingly accepted Christianity, and had his baptism in 1491, after which he changed his name to adopt a more Portuguese name. At first the Portuguese were happy to trade with the Bakongo for ivory and copper, but then the trouble started. The Portuguese soon demanded slaves for use in their sugarcane plantations. They initially purchased labour, but when the Bakongo protested to the slavery, they began kidnapping people and eventually attacked villages as slaves. Due to Portuguese influence, elections were soon scrapped and kingship adopted the European style of hereditary succession. The new king wrote many letters to the king of Portugal, protesting the slave trade, but was eventually forced to give over slaves. The Portuguese procured 2,000 to 3,000 slaves per year for a few years, but this was still not enough for the Portuguese, and they announced that they would offer luxury goods for captured slaves. This led to raids between ethnic groups, and soon the slave raids and volume of trade in enslaved human beings increased thereafter, and by the 1560s, over 7,000 slaves per year were being captured and exported by Portuguese traders to the Americas. Throughout the years, there was incredible resistance from the Bakonga people, and this resistance has been portrayed terribly in history. They were depicted as cannibals and dehumanized. History has often painted the Bakonga people as pagan barbarians and have justified the slave trade started by the Portuguese. The Kingdom of Congo and its people ended their relations with the Portuguese in the 1660s. So, in 1665, the Portuguese army invaded the kingdom, killed the Congo king, disbanded his army, and stole the person of their choosing in his place. The Bakongo people, now divided and fragmented, were annexed in the 19th century by three European colonial empires during the scramble for Africa and Berlin Conference. Now, for those who don't know, the Scramble for Africa was a division and allocation of the continent by European forces, and the Berlin Conference regulated European colonization of Africa with Germany as an imperial power. The northernmost parts went to France, which are now the Republic of Congo and Gabon, the middle part along the River Congo, along with uh, the large inland region of Africa, went to Belgium, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the southern parts, which is now Angola, remained with Portugal. Now, there, was, uh, there were intensive attempts in all three areas by the Bakongo people to achieve independence, and in 1960, the French and Belgian regions became independent, and in 1975, Angola achieved independence. This is ridiculously late when you really think about it. Alright, so let's start our tale. One day, Elephant was walking near a village and humming to himself. He was enjoying the sunlight and the sounds of the birds so much that he was unaware of where he was stepping. With a mighty crash, Elephant fell into a man-made pit. And soon, a hunter came by and, to his delight, found the elephant sitting in the pit. He let out a whoop of joy and began dancing around the pit. Ah ha Elephant, you have fallen into my trap. There it was plain to see, yet you've walked into it. It is stupidity that has brought you to this fate. The elephant lifted his head and stared at the hunter calmly. It is stupidity that has brought me here. Cleverness will bring you here too. The hunter fell over in shock. The, the elephant, it speaks. He ran back to the village to tell all of his friends, but they laughed at him and accused him of lying. So the hunter promised them that if he was lying, 
he would move out of the village and live forever on the edge of the forest. So the villagers agreed and followed the hunter to his pit. Soon they approached the pit, and the hunter shouted down to the elephant, You, great one, stupidity has brought you here. But the elephant did not speak. Again the hunter shouted the same thing, but elephant remained silent. The villagers shook their head and began to murmur amongst themselves. The hunter grew frantic and was hot in the face. He began prodding the elephant with the back of his spear, and shouted again, Elephant, it is stupidity which brought you here. Speak, you stupid thing. But Elephant said nothing. The villagers soon began shouting at the hunter, accusing him of lying, and told him to stay out here forever. They left him behind and returned to the village. The hunter threw his spear to the ground in anger and embarrassment, and sat on the ground with his head in his hands. Oh, stupid Elephant, see what you have done. But Elephant simply chuckled and said, it is my stupidity which brought me here, but your cleverness brought you here too. One of us was too stupid, the other too clever, and so we're here together. And that's why we have the saying, too foolish and too clever, they are brothers. Ah, uh, the poor silly hunter. A pretty voice recorder hadn't been invented yet, otherwise the hunter may have been a bit luckier. Both stories are from a book called When Elephant Was King by Nick Greaves. I really enjoyed these stories and I hope you did too. Elephants are amazing creatures and you should go read up more about them and how to help preserve them and their environment. There are some great initiatives which you can support such as Save the Elephants. It's an organization trying to preserve the habitat of the elephant and promote awareness of the importance of these creatures. There are other ways as well, um, such as supporting a complete ban on ivory, uh, not buying any ivory products, and supporting tour operators who actively support elephant conservation. Now, of course, before you go, I have a lovely promo for you and a couple of podcast recommendations. Today's promo is from the lovely Hidden in the Shadows podcast, which is all about the strange, unusual, and the paranormal. Welcome to the podcast that discusses the things that are hidden in the shadows. This is Isaac. And I'm Megan. And on this podcast, we discuss everything paranormal from ghosts, demons, aliens, urban legends, and more. From our own experiences and others, we will discuss the strange and unusual. Tune in every Friday for new episodes. The Fairy Folk. Join us on our audio adventure through the United Kingdom, where you can explore some of the country's best-loved folklore, myths, and legends, all without leaving the comfort of your own home. Now, I love this show. It's an old favorite of mine, and I love how you feel like you're walking through the streets with the host, and she's telling you the various tales of each place. It's fun, relaxing, and each episode is perfect to listen to when you're traveling, whether it be in the car, on the bus, on your bike, wherever. Find the fairy folk on Twitter and Instagram at, at the fairy underscore folk, and that's fairy F A E R I E. Folklore, food, and fairy tales. A storytelling podcast featuring stories with recipes and food history connected to each episode's story. Is the food and fairy tales and folklore really symbolic, or does it just make the tale relatable? If you had to choose between the two, could you? Food and stories have their own rituals and feed different parts of us. How is the history of food tied into stories? Will this podcast answer these questions, or will there just be a great story and a highly tenuous link to a delicious recipe? You'll have to listen to find out. Okay, I mean, do I really have to say more than the title of this podcast to get your attention? It's literally put two of my favorite things together, food and folk tales. I listened to Jasper and the Hares with a smidgen of apricot flapjack, and it was a real delight. I really enjoyed the host style and had a good few laugh too. And of course, the recipe for apricot flapjacks looked lovely. I really gotta try it at some point. Find folklore, food, and fairy tales on Twitter and Instagram at fairytalesfood. Box of Oddities Cat and Jethro Gilligan Toth bring their irreverent brand of humor and unique chemistry to an exploration of the strange, the bizarre, and the unexpected. With over 7 million downloads since its 2018 launch, The Box of Oddities has become one of the fastest growing comedy podcasts in the United States. Okay, so I know I usually promote indie podcasts during this section, but I just had to speak a little bit about Box of Oddities because it is one of my favorite podcasts of all time, and it's really gotten me through a lot. Cat and Jethro got me into the podcasting world, and I have loved every bit of it since then. 
always entertaining, always hilarious, and always strange. I promise you, your life will be better from listening to the Box of Oddities. Find Box of Oddities on Twitter at Box of Oddities and on Instagram at Box of Oddities Podcast. So that wraps up today's episode. I have been your host, the Shira, the disembodied voice you can't escape. And Legendary Africa is produced by the infamous Hestia the Dog, and we have an unpaid intern, as you know, Athena the Doggo. Thank you for listening and joining me today. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to subscribe to Legendary Africa wherever you listen. iTunes, Spotify, CastBox, wherever. And to share with your friends, family, and assorted pets. Also, if you enjoy the podcast and want to share that love, please go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes or Podchaser. We also have a YouTube channel where I publish each episode, and I have just updated the website, so go check that out. And as always, feel free to add to the tribute page for Ashalia by emailing me your message. All links can be found in the episode description below. Check us out on at LegendaryPod on Instagram and at LegendaryPod1 on Twitter. I'll see you next Saturday with an all-new ancient myth, legend, or tale from my beautiful continent of Africa. Until then, tell your loved ones you love them, thank the angel on your shoulder, stay safe, Stay sexy, and stay legendary. Bye!